This is an, um, a wonderful piece. This is called Red Fuji. It's from uh, Hokusai, who's a block printer, a brilliant block printer. He has 36 views of Mount Fuji as a series that he did. This is the, the one called Red Fuji. Um, and I'm going to talk about block printing as one of the art forms, but in the next 45 minutes, I'm going to skip over uh, Japanese painting, calligraphy, block printing, and this, of which this is an example, uh, manja and anime briefly, ceramic, sculpture, poetry, no and kabuki theater, uh, origami, ikebana, bonsai, architecture, and gardens. So everybody grab your backsides. We're going to go on a ride here, okay? Um, but it, we're there is a very distinctive um, aesthetic in Japanese art. I talked this um, this morning about Japanese gardens having a very distinctive aesthetic. Um, this is this reflected. This is reflected not only in the gardens, which I'm going to mention briefly at the end here, but also in all the art forms. It is a a kind of minimalism. It's greatly affected by the religious beliefs of uh, Japan, particularly Buddhism in the seventh and eighth centuries. Remember the sixth centuries when Buddhism came over from Korea, but in the seventh and eighth century, the religious uh, motivations, and then especially in the ninth century, began to be expressed in a unique kind of aesthetic and artistic expression that is distinct from China or Korea or anywhere else. So, let's go for a ride. Um, Japanese painting. Painting is one of the oldest and most refined of, the, refined of the Japanese arts in terms of age, second only to pottery or ceramics, which we'll talk about. The Japanese painting has been done on both paper and to a great extent on silk, which is different than a lot of other uh, areas. The, it started in Chinese origins and yet developed its own aesthetic in the 8th, 9th centuries and then after the 16th century there was significant influence by Westerners. A lot of the early painting especially was Buddhist religious painting um, including various kinds of ink washed landscapes uh, plus natural images of birds and flowers and things of that sort. The, this is an example of a very simple kind of minimalistic uh, using a brush, they typically, the art that is done, including the writing that is done, I'll talk about calligraphy, is done with a brush rather than with a pen. There's, a, you know, modern Japanese artists will use a pen, but mo for the most part, even in drawing, they will use a brush. You, you get the example here on the right-hand side of calligraphy along with a simple brush painting. Um, there is an economy of line and economy of form that is usually manifest in Japanese painting, but there have been Western influences. As you see down here, this is a Western style sailing ship in a Japanese painting arriving at shore. Here you have uh, an extraordinary peacock painting. This would have been done on silk. And so you do get, it's not all simplistic, but the particular aesthetic is one in which there's a conservation of line a simplicity of form in order to convey. And I talk about the difference in perspective, that they will overlap uh, things in terms of clarity and darkness in order to give a sense of a perspective of things going off into the distance. So this is very common. Japanese painting is called Nihonga style painting. The next, uh, which is related to painting, is calligraphy. Calligraphy is uh, called Shuji. In Japan, it is a high art form. It's the artistic writing of Japanese characters using brush and ink, again, on either paper or silk. Um, today, Even today in Japan, it's believed to be a, a good discipline. It's believed to be good for children to have them sit and uh, quietly practice calligraphy. They do it in schools. Now, not all children are required to take calligraphy, but they do still offer calligraphy classes in uh, brush calligraphy classes in schools. In fact, high schools have competitions in performance calligraphy in which they're evaluated based upon the creativity they have. The Japanese calligraphy was influenced by and it also influenced Zen Buddhism. And the reason for that is when you sit down with a piece of paper and a, a brush and ink and they will grind their own ink, there's a process similar sort of almost the tea ceremony where there's a process that you go through to prepare yourself for, for this. When you sit in front of a piece of paper with a brush and ink, you don't, you don't get a second chance. You know, you need to make sure that you know uh, what you're doing before you apply the brush to the paper. There's no corrections. There's no do-overs. Um, the, the very best you can do is get a different uh, piece of paper or a different piece of silk. So because of that, 
a Zen calligrapher will study the uh, paper or the silk that they're going to be working on. They will study what the letters and the idea is to clear one's mind and to meditate on the, the, the medium, the paper. And when you actually start the process of the calligraphy, rather than force it, the letter should flow from the end of the brush. Uh, if a person is hesitant, if they're not really sure that this is what they want to do, then that will, that will be clear to the, the person reviewing this. And so the meditation, the preparation, the confidence that one is, it knows where you're going with the brush um, in this sort of one-time one effort to try to create calligraphy is very important. I mentioned the tea ceremony. The practice of calligraphy often, especially for Zen masters, will be preceded by um, in, an exercise of calligraphy because it too is a meditative form and so they will perform calligraphy and then move into the tea ceremony as part of the meditation. Someone asked me in one of the previous cruises what this says. I have no idea what that says because that's really not the point of this. While there is writing, the, the, the point of the calligraphy is the beauty of the characters themselves. It's creating something that visually is um, pleasing, it's exciting, has an aesthetic, simply by the creation of the characters on paper. And of course, the, the Japanese characters uh, are, are uh, lots, of, lots of different lines and elements involved in them, and so there is real skill in doing them in a way that's attractive. Um, often calligraphy will be accompanied by painting, or the other way around, a painting will be accompanied by calligraphy. This is an example where they have done some very simple blossoms. Uh, again, monotone, ink on uh, paper or silk, and then the calligraphy goes along with it. It's sort of like illustrated poetry in that regard. We then come to one of my very favorites, which is block printing. Uh, block printing is to take a medium, originally it was wood block, they now use uh, uh, linoleum block and other types of block printing where originally this was done in order to print books or mantras or sutras uh, because movable type wasn't available. In, in uh, the Far East, they actually did invent movable type well before it was invented by um, the Gutenbergs and the various people in the West. But initially it was used for being able to print multiples of particularly religious writings like mantras and sutras. But then it also has been used for the creation of beautiful art forms. The uh, Japanese, as with the Chinese, they will typically use water-based inks rather than um, oil-based inks, as they do more in the West, and because of that, they can get a lot more effects. They can, uh, there's brighter colors, they can get washes and transparencies. Um, again, this began as a religious practice in Buddhist temples as early as the 8th century. And there's a lot of different styles. There are mono prints, which use only one color. There are mono prints, which then may be hand colored, but the most exciting kinds, this is uh, Hokusai. If you have a chance to see any of the work, he's the same guy that did the red Fuji that I showed you a minute ago. Um, his work was is truly brilliant. Uh, to give you an idea, every one of the colors in this, the different tones of blue, the browns, the, uh, everything, would have been a separately carved block, which then get inked separately and printed on the paper or silk, depending upon the medium they're using. And so the idea of registering this, which means lining them up so that the colors match uh, in cases where you get gradation, like in here, they would, uh, the artist would add the ink and then soften it with, a, with strokes in order to get a gradation. But you can imagine how many different layers of printing is involved in a piece like this. Uh, just, and this is one of the most famous ones. This is the Great Wave, wave of um, Kanagawa, and you'll see it on t-shirts, and you'll see parodies of it. We saw one of them with the boats had little happy cats on them and uh, all kinds of things. But uh, beautiful, beautiful work. In fact, the last port that we stop in, Shimizu, there's an opportunity to go to a cultural center. Uh, there's a tea ceremony involved in that excursion. There's also the opportunity to visit the work of a particular block printing artist. And they even have it set up so that you can make your own block print. So you might want to check that out. Uh, it's very fun. Uh, Carolyn and I did it, and we were thinking of going back and doing it again because we just, the, the prints. It's a fairly size, good sized museum and just beautiful, beautiful work. So I recommend that to you. Very much one of my favorite kinds of uh, styles of 
Japanese art is their block printing. We of course then have, more modern times, anime and uh, manga. Anime is illustration that are hand-drawn or computer-generated. It literally means animation. This, um, the colored ones here and here are examples of anime. Anime is usually a uh, produced on DVD or it online or it used to be films. Um, actually, anime has been around since the, the 1917 was the early examples of it. You know, back in the Steamboat Willie days when the, when film was just a new a new idea. Today, the majority of it is done either through television, uh, streaming, or DVD. And there are over 430 anime production studios in Japan. It is a uniquely Japanese approach to the arts. Uh, usually the very large eyes, very stylized kinds of images, but anime is color and it's motion. Whereas manga, which means whimsical drawings, is almost always black and white, not always, but almost always black and white, and it's almost always in serialized or published form. Um, there will be serial manga magazines, which will have multiple <laughs> stories, and it will go from month to month um, that you can follow them. Now, this may look like comic books to you, but in Japan, virtually everyone reads manga, not just kids. The manga and has many, many different genres, action, adventure, business and commerce, comedy, detective, historical drama, horror, mystery, romance, science fiction and fantasy, sport and games, and even adult-themed manga. Um, I'll, that's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, the, and manga is a major part of the Japanese publishing industry. In 2009, which is the most recent numbers I could find, uh, manga in Japan was a 3.5 billion dollar industry. So manga is everywhere in Japan. You, we can't talk about modern versions of Japanese art without referring to manga because it is so dominant in the modern culture today. Um, so, and you will see it on, on newsstands and things of that sort because everyone reads these things. Sort of backing up now, I'll talk just briefly about ceramics. Um, ceramics is even older than, than painting as a, an art form. Ceramics, as I've mentioned before, when we've talked about the history of different places, is almost always one of the very first indications that archaeologists have that a civilization has, has developed in a certain place because every culture has some sort of clay pots of some level of sophistication that they have used for holding uh, beverages, grain, you know, etc. And so the oldest Japanese uh, examples are between 10 and 12,000 years old from the Joman period. And we, remember I talked about that. This, um, this item down here on the left, which is a sculpture, still has the characteristics of the Joman or the rope design period, uh, as do some of the ceramic pots and things. They use ropes or rope design in order in a decoration. Later on in the next, that's the first named period we have, the Joman period in Japan. The second period after that, uh, which was called the Yayoi period, got much more sophisticated with their ceramics and they fired them at higher temperatures. They developed a wheel to, to build their ceramics on uh, but they also did a lot with hand-built sculptures. This one is from the uh, Yayoi period, and then obviously later on they got much more sophisticated in terms of their sculpture, not only in, in uh, well, ceramic sculpture particularly we're talking about here. They uh, later on developed into other media, in wood and metal, etc. The uh, From the 5th century on, the ceramic and uh, sculpture kinds of things, clay sculpture in Japan was greatly influenced by the Silk Road which began in 200, uh, the second century BC, and carried on. So from the fifth century on, the various influences came along the Silk Road. Uh, many of the idols that were created in these kind of forms were created for the Buddhist or Shinto, uh, Buddhist temples or Shinto shrines. We obviously then later on get a much more sophisticated kind of ceramic. I mentioned that in the 16th century, when the Japanese invaded twice, in, late in the 16th century, invaded Korea, they brought ceramicists back with them. And they developed porcelain to a more refined degree in Japan than ever before. They were Korean artists that were brought over to Japan. And so a lot of the most beautiful of the styles of ceramics in Japan are really attributable to things that the Korean uh, artists brought. And then you get these beautiful glazes and artistic ceramics 
obviously ceramics is something that, um, that people are very interested in here in Japan. Going to the writing arts, I could talk about novels, some of my, my favorite novelists, uh, Yukio Mishima and um, uh, Kurugawa and others are, are Japanese, but talk about poetry here. This is uh, a piece of art of a poet preparing to write, and he's considering the beauty of the out of doors just outside his, his uh, house. Poetry has always been linked to calligraphy. Um, the, the use of calligraphy of a brush in order to, and whenever you see somebody like this, they're not holding a pen, they're holding a brush, and this little black thing here is the, uh, the ink well that he will be working from. The, traditionally, the first poem believed to be in Japanese history was a poem that was shared, is actually, you know, I guess two poems between Azanagi and Azanami, who are the creation kami, the two great spirits that were responsible for creation. Azanagi is uh, he who invites, Azanami is she who is invited. Apparently when they first saw each other, before Azanagi could say anything, uh, the male uh, kami, the female kami speaks, she says, what joy beyond compare to see a man so fair. And she ruined everything because she wasn't supposed to talk first. Uh, she's the one who is to be invited, not the one to invite. So Azanagi said, no, no, back up, back up, back up. And so they had to start all over again. They came back around the world pillar, and when they saw each other, then Azanagi speaks first, and he, being very creative as he was, he said, to see a woman so fair, what joy beyond compare. <laughs> not very original, but at least he got to, when they started over, he got to speak first. So poetry has, this is the, at the point of creation. Um, th this is the legend, and so the idea that poetry has always been part of the, the Japanese experience, it is critically important. There are a lot of, a number of different Japanese forms of poetry. First of all, there's kanshi, which is Han poetry. Uh, Han is the, the, is a reference to Japan, or, I'm sorry, to China. The Han are what the Chinese called themselves. The Han Empire was one of the most important of the early dynasties, if you will. <laughs> Um, so, uh, kanji or Han poetry in Japan uses the Chinese characters that have been brought over into Japanese, and also it's a Chinese style. In the Japanese style, when they moved away from kanji poetry, they have what's called waka, which literally means poetry. And it is, uh, you, there's a number of different styles, usually uh, the most common is tanka. Tanka has a meter or rhythm that is in syllables of 57577. So it's a very distinct meter. A, an abbreviated form of that is one you're probably familiar with, which is haiku. How many of you had a teacher in elementary school who had you write haiku, right? It's um, it, the idea of 575. Five. It's three line poems. Usually, uh, the traditional uh, approach to it is to have two images in nature that get compared or contrasted by a connector. So th there's a very specific kind of structure in terms of theme as well as the meter in uh, ha haiku. But poetry has always been very important. Uh, it was expected, as I talked about when I talked about samurai in the Code of Bushido, that samurai would be poets. Before one committed seppuku, was, you were expected to write your death poem. Um, so poetry has always been seen as, as something that any cultured Japanese person would appreciate and even write. We then get into the traditional Japanese performance arts. Um, how many of you went to, um, I don't watch you, Maya, the <laughs> island? <laughs> yes, uh, what's the name of the island? Which island, I'm sorry. Where the Torii, the red Torii is. Oh, yeah. Just through a complete. Miyamaka. Miyajima. Miyajima. I'm sorry, I just, just forgot who I was. Um, Miyajima, the island, when we were over there, when you walked around the, uh, the shrine, the, the Shinto shrine, at one point, they had a stage. You remember that? Does this look familiar? Okay. The, the stage at that shrine was a no theater stage. No is a, a theater form. No literally means skill or talent. It's been practiced since the 14th century, the 1300s. It is the oldest form of theater still practiced today. No theater is still being done. Um, historically, there would be five different no plays presented in sequence uh, with 
inter, inter, in between each one, there would be a comedic a Kyogen play, and so it would be an all-day affair. Now they typically do two no plays with one comedic play, a short comedic play in between. But this is the standard stage, and that's exactly what it looked like, even to the point of the decoration, you know, the, the tree and the design in the background. Um, there is an entry um, walkway here, the main stage, on behind the performers, there will be uh, musicians to accompany because it is a form of uh, theater and, and music and the movement that is uh, historically very, very important to the Japanese people. It has been influenced and used in Buddhist, in Shinto, and in folk religions, all with traditional instruments. In fact, some of the instruments that they still today use in no theater are some of the oldest instruments known. And, and they found examples of stone flutes, uh, of the frames for stringed instruments, in archaeological digs that are the oldest instruments known. And versions of those are still used today in no theater. And then over on the right-hand side, this is a chorus. And they will, from time to time, contribute to uh, the main action that's going on. Um, no uses masks, um, they, whereas Kabuki, I'll talk about in a second, has a, a great deal of makeup and stylized facial gestures. In No, they use masks to represent various characters. It can be ghosts, women, children, elderly people, etc. And these masks are works of art. This is the same mask with the same lighting, except uh, tilted differently because the control, they're very specific in how they control it. You'll notice the mask on the left almost looks happy, right? The one in the center looks a little bit concerned, and this one looks terrified. It's all the same mask, the same lighting. It's just a matter, it's designed, created in such a way that depending upon how the, uh, the actor uses it, they can give a very different impression in terms of the character that they're representing. Traditionally, um, no theater, most of them represent a, a story from, again, tradition that is a supernatural being that tra gets transformed into a human being and then narrates a story. Um, there are, besides masks, there are costumes, props, stylized gestures. It's extremely codified and controlled. You know, this, this is not free-range theater. It is all according to very strict standards and has been since the 14th century. So this is one of the most important, this image over here you can barely see, this is a modern no stage and no performance that's going on. The next, which you may more likely have heard of, is Kabuki. Kabuki theater is um, much more recent. It originated in the 17th century and again is still practiced today. Kabuki literally means the art of singing and dancing, or another way to translate it is avant-garde theater. It's from the 17th century, so it's avant-garde. Um, but similar to no, Kabuki will usually be done, even today, in a day-long performance. People will take the day and go to the theater, and there will be five uh, act plays. The plays always have a short first act that's sort of leisurely, and in which they represent the plot and the characters and introduce them. And then as it goes through the five acts of the play, it will speed up in a very measured way with uh, like two of the acts representing conflict. Um, and then the fifth and final act, which is pretty abrupt, will have some major revelation or some, some unveiling of something is typical. Um, in fact, they use a lot of different kinds of special effects in order to communicate this unveiling. It may be that a character that's been introduced all the way along, you find out at the very end, is not who you thought they were. And it may be that a stagehand will come out and rip the costume off and they've got something completely different on underneath and you realize that they're a completely different character. Um, originally, when it began in the 17th century in Kyoto, it was all women that performed this. It was called Ona Kabuki. And at that time, the women after the play were available for prostitution. <laughs> Did you have something you wanted to say? <laughs> Just rang the bell. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Made you remember something in your past, did it? Sorry. No. Uh, <laughs> uh, right. Anyway, sorry about that. Right. But because the, when the shogun came along, the shoguns did not like the, you know, they were the disciplined military guys. They didn't like that, and so they forbade uh, kabuki. Later on, it made a comeback as male theater, so that all the parts, including the female parts, were played by men. This is called Yaro Kabuki. The set is, uh, stage is very different than no. You have a, a can be even a multi-level stage, and there's always a runway. 
so that entrances can come in and out. Um, the, the audience is frequently sort of surrounded by aspects of the stage. It's like go and spend a day of it. Um, and people would use this, uh, the, the stage projection is called um, a hamachi. So in addition to costume changes and revelations, they had over time developed lots of different stage trips for this goal of uh, revelation, of a sudden revealing of something or a surprise. They would have uh, stages that would revolve. They would have trap doors that people could disappear. They even invented uh, flying, which was called um, shumori. And that meant that they would literally be on cables, you know, or, or wires, and would be able to fly in and out. So phenomenal. <coughs> Typically, um, kabuki is in one of three uh, genres. It's either historical plays, domestic stories, including love suicide stories, and then uh, various dance pieces. And these are different, different characters in kabuki dress down here. Uh, very flamboyant costumes, very vivid. And in, in, um, in theater, both Chinese and Japanese theater, in this case, the colors that are used, even the colors of makeup, represent things. You know, different colors represent good guys, bad guys, ambitious people, etc. And so all of this is very much according to rules. And everyone who knows the rules will understand immediately the character shows up based upon the colors they wear and other aspects of the character, who they represent in terms of the style of character. We then have origami. And I know a number of you have been participating in the learning to fold cranes. Origami uh, literally means folding paper. And it is the Japanese art of taking a square sheet of paper, typically with no cuts and no glue, and being able to fold it into uh, beautiful pieces of art, representing usually uh, animals, crane being the most popular. This is a very spectacular form of folded crane. Uh, but I, if you go online and look up origami, it's astonishing what they can accomplish. In fact, uh, we met a woman, a uh, couple, uh, on one of the earlier cruises, like two, two cruises ago, and she's the curator of the Norton Simon Museum in uh, Pasadena. And she showed me some images on her phone. They had had a display there of an origami artist who uses computers to design the folds. And he had astonishing things. From, and then he would show, you know, you'd look at something and you'd think, yeah, that's a lobster or whatever. <laughs> and then they would show it unfolded and it was a flat piece of paper. So they do phenomenal things today. Um, and I don't think that's cheating at all to help the, have the computer help you figure this out because he still had to have the skill to do it. There's a version of origami, well, it's a different art, but similar, uh, called kirigami, which is cut paper, where you're allowed to make uh, cuts in the paper in order to make more complicated folds. If you go online and look up kirigami, K-I-R-I-G-A-M-I, -I, then you'll see some phenomenal examples of that. Another art form, represented up here is ikebana. Ikebana is, uh, means living flowers. The Japanese approach to um, flower arrangement in ikebana, or another version of that, kado means the way of flowers. Remember, do always means the way of. Kado is the way of flowers. They, uh, starting back over 1300 years ago, they began to develop uh, the, a unique approach to, to, to arrangement of flowers. In most Western flower arrangement, if you've got a lily on the left side, it'll be balanced by a lily on the right side so that they form sort of a nice, even pattern. That's <coughs> completely different than Ikebana. Ikebana tends to be a very informal um, kind of balance where you, you don't try to balance the thing out left or right. And so you get these beautiful sort of extended stem kinds of things, um, absolutely gorgeous kinds of art. They had a display a couple years ago, a few years ago when we were in Seattle, of Ikebana at the convention center there, and just stunning things. Um, so I, I, if you don't know Ikebana, I recommend that you find a, a, a really good florist somewhere that does Ikebana or carries Ikebana and, and experience that. And then finally, the, um, the one of these that I've actually practiced some is bonsai. Bonsai means tray planting. And tray planting is to, to cultivate small trees in a tray so that they look, um, they have the same shape and proportion of full-size trees. You know, this tree, for instance, is in a tray, and it's, I think, uh, it was 16 inches tall. 
So uh, you can do, um, like, uh, I once did a birch grove. I killed it, but it was nice while it was alive. Um, uh, uh, it's always an odd number, and I had seven small birch trees in a tray. And so this idea, and they, some of these are hundreds and hundreds of years old. They will work on them for generations, and they will use wire to control the direction of the branches and very careful clipping. Um, and it, again, is a very refined art to create these trees that are tiny, but have the proportion and look of a, uh, a full-size tree. Then, Japanese architecture. Uh, you've seen examples of these sort of things everywhere we've gone. Traditionally, Japanese buildings are wooden structures in almost every case. Um, they would use stone, like for the fortress over here, this castle on the right-hand side. Uh, sometimes you would see stone in other locations as part of the foundation, mainly because, of course, if you don't have a stone foundation separating the earth from the wood, then the wood's not going to last very long because of the seepage of moisture up into it. But other than the foundations, um, they would always be wooden. Usually it'd be more common to have them elevated off, off the ground. You'll see uh, either stone pillars or you'll see wooden uh, supports for the buildings. They're off the ground, they tend to have tiled or thatched roofs. They will use cypress bark and layer it in these extraordinary thatch, unlike the thatch that they have, say, in parts of England still, if you go to the Cotswolds, they will use a straw thatch. They use bark, cypress bark here, and, and uh, create beautiful things. The outside walls, or the fushuma, uh, fusuma, excuse me, the fusuma walls on a traditional dwelling um, in Japan are movable. There are no weight-bearing walls in a Japanese house. It's entirely supported by pillars and cross pieces. Uh, now, again, we're talking traditional. There are modern homes that have weight-bearing walls, but the idea is that the walls should be able to open up so that you have a complete view of outside. Similarly, inside the house, you will have uh, sliding screens or showy screens that allow you to open up or close off sections of the house at various times. Um, the interior spaces will not have stationary furniture in the traditional sense. You'll have cushions um, that can be put away. You'll have futons that will be put away in drawers and brought out uh, for sleeping. So the idea is a very minimalist space. The floors are always traditionally made out of tatami mats. Um, and I'll, talk, I'll show you some examples of that in a minute. Tatami mats, usually five centimeters or so thick, are uh, almost always the flooring in a traditional home especially. Um, there are no arches or um, those kinds of weight-bearing things. Again, it's all pillars, posts, and lentils or cross pieces that support it. The most intricate part of Japanese buildings is always the roof line. Um, beautiful arches, beautiful tile work. You know, they'll have uh, clay tile that they then will seal with, uh, it almost looks like it's made out of lead or, or metal, but those are um, the sealed tiles. This is an example, um, you've seen pagodas, right? A pagoda is a far eastern version of something that's called a stupa in South Asia, in India and other areas that, that are Buddhist. A stupa, which this represents, was a place where you kept relics, that is the bones or, or remains of a Buddha or of a great teacher, it's like a tomb. Well, when that idea, when Buddhism came over and came to Japan, they took Japanese building style and created their version of that, which is a pagoda. So it's typically a place where relics, the, the remains of a teacher or, or Buddha are kept. And you'll notice uh, the most common, it's not universal, but the most common kind of pagoda that I've seen are five levels. You'll notice one, two, three, four, five. I told you about this morning the Daidoros, the uh, stone lanterns, that they had five levels. The bottom one represented the earth or chi, the second level, the sui, or the water. The third level, the ka, or fire, and then the, um, the air, and then the spirit. Five-level pagodas represent the same thing in Buddhist cosmology. That it is, uh, the five levels represent the earth, water, fire, air, and spirit. And so you will often see five-level pagodas. Those of you who are climbing up on the mountain tomorrow, Carolyn and I did that before, we're, we're going to do it again. It's a great climb, but it is strenuous. If you're thinking about going, you know, going up the mountain, no, it is a strenuous climb. But um, it's it's beautiful. There's beautiful things up there, and they have a five-tier pagoda up there. The um, 
give you a couple of other images of some of the other kinds of buildings again whereas the lower parts will typically be fairly simple it's the roof lines that are even both dramatic in their shape and also in their decoration this i put up here again this is the golden pagoda uh, or the golden pavilion excuse me in kyoto um, it is more a chinese style than it is a japanese style building but you get these extraordinary structures Sometimes the ornamentation on the roof line and below it are really extraordinary, as in this, the case of this Buddhist temple. But the interiors tend to be, at least of the homes, tend to be like this, um, where they, there is a, a Taoist influence that says that minimalism is the goal. That you don't, uh, Taoism says that everything is temporary. That that nothing is permanent, Imper impermanence is a basic part of existence, and so therefore, in a Japanese home, everything is either movable or removable. Rather than have things, I mean, in other words, you don't have a lot of baby grand pianos in a, a Japanese home, or at least a traditional Japanese home, because to redecorate a Japanese home means to get a different flower arrangement or a different wall hanging, and you've redecorated. Because it's a very, uh, it's, there's a very clean aesthetic. These are tatami mats. Tatami mats are all the same size. They're about 0.9 meters by 1.8 meters. And um, they're, they're all standard. And they will talk about the size of a room in terms of tatami mats. You know, this is an eight mat room. You know, this is a six mat room. Uh, the standard measurement that they use, which is called a ken, K-E-N, um, is the size of two tatami mats. And that is the basic measuring size that they used in traditional building. Um, so it's the size of two tatami mats. So this has been a, a dominant kind of measurement approach to them, to the Japanese uh, for millennia almost. They typically will, uh, within the homes, they will have only natural colors, no bright colors, the opposite of Mexico. You know, our house in Mexico has bright yellow on the outside and bright blue on the outside and burgundy and orange and all kinds of things because that's the style. Well, in a Japanese home, you will have natural colors, uh, usually schemes of black, white, off-white, gray, and brown. Um, they don't go for, you know, the, the splash of color. It's much more subdued, at a very Taoist kind of uh, simplistic kind of approach. And there's a real beauty to that minimalism that you find in a Japanese home or building. And as you can see here, this is an example that the exterior walls can open and close as well as interior walls so that you can open it up to the outside uh, the support is from the various posts uh, that, that hold up the roof and of course I talk about Japanese gardens as being a very high art form they are to represent natural ancient miniaturized landscapes um, they're full of symbolism. Rocks can represent mountains or uh, turtles from mythology. Stones can be carp. Bridges can represent the past, present, and future or the relationship with the Amada Buddha. There's no artificial ornamentation. Um, it's to suggest an ancient and perhaps far away kind of landscape. It's almost more natural than nature itself is kind of the goal. And so this is an example of a, of a Zen garden, a dry garden, and you'll notice that it's raked around the stones and then um, lengthwise other than that and the med not only does that create an effect but the very act of raking it will be an act of meditation for those who prepare it um, and placement of the stones as we talked about earlier this morning is very specific very intentional uh, and they they as a garden master would say they listen to the stones and the stones will tell them the right place to put them okay so that is a 40 minute, completely unsatisfactory survey of all the different uh, Japanese arts and architecture, but I just wanted you to introduce, introduce you to a few of them and, and give you some ideas of what to look for um, throughout the rest of your trip. And again, in Shimizu, the last stop, there is the opportunity, one of the excursions, I think two of the excursions, end up going to the block printing house. It's where they also have a tea ceremony. Uh, you can see more of these kinds of beautiful block prints, which are absolutely my favorites. All right, before I forget, I'm gonna put that out. That's the website, and I'm, I'm gonna check by twice today, and I keep missing Natasha, the guest services manager, but we will try to get this printed in the last day's program. So you'll have, if you haven't had a chance to copy this down or, or 
take a picture of it or whatever, we'll have that included for you. So any questions about any of those art forms? I don't claim to be a, an expert on all of them, but uh, enough to be able to answer basic questions. Any questions, thoughts? Yes, feel safe. What's that? Well, uh, daily. I mean, they, they would be, in fact, sometimes, several times daily. They, people don't trace through them. Again, if you ever see a garden like the one I just showed you, don't walk out on those gravel. Um, you, you know, they, I, I don't know quite how they would react to that, but they, the, because it's an act of meditation, they will do it as often as they feel prompted to, but at least on a daily basis, they will make sure that everything is cleaned and aligned and, and look like that. Any other questions? All right, well, enjoy the rest of your day at sea.